All right, the book of Judges, please, chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 12 down to verse 23, although maybe we'll cover more than that, but just for reading purposes, beginning in verse 12, it says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. And by him, the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length. And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present, but he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and the dirt came out. Then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. And again, God will indeed bless the reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. This is a very uh, interesting passage, also a kind of a humorous passage in many ways, but uh, it's, it's a great practical passage. And it deals with Ehud and his battle against Eglon. And we'd, we would put it this way, Ehud and the tyranny of the flesh, because Eglon is a definite type of the flesh. And it speaks of that battle that every one of us face with the flesh. And so it's of very significance, great significance to us. Now, the first thing we need to just to observe is that Othniel was the first judge, and he had come from the tribe of Judah. And the second judge, Ehud, was a left-handed man who came from Judah's neighbor, Benjamin. Okay, so from David's, uh, uh, from uh, Judah's neighbor, Benjamin. So it tells us in verse 12, again, very sad words. It says, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So once again, they're doing evil. After the death of Othniel, uh, no matter how much pain they suffered during their times of sinfulness, they soon went back to the same old ways. They seem to never learn the lessons of their discipline. And so as soon as their pain disappeared, they returned to their evil ways. And the, the problem was they got accustomed to doing evil. They got used to it. And it's a tragic situation when a child of God gets used to and even comfortable with sinning. I want you to notice, too, that it says they did evil against the sight of the Lord. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting that um, they may not have been considered to be even sinful culturally. Uh, their neighbors, uh, the Canaanites, probably thought they were good, upstanding people because they were just doing the same things they were. And so it's possible in some ways for, for what we do to be acceptable in the general society and the general culture. But we need to always remember that sin 
is first and foremost against the sight of the Lord. It's against him. I remember David, against thee, against thee only have I sinned. And whether it's acceptable culturally, the question is, is it acceptable in his sight, in his eyes? And of course, the answer is it isn't. And we need to be conscious that we live our lives in his sight. Uh, Nothing is hidden from his view. And so twice in this verse, it talks about that they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And somehow we've got to recognize that. And of course, it doesn't describe what their sin was, but we know by now that it's a descent into idolatry with all the resultant immorality that goes along with it. And so, as we say, sin may be culturally acceptable, but it's not in the sight of the Lord because God, who is infinitely holy, hates sin. And so it's done in his sight. And so as a result of that, we read a very tragic statement. So we've seen Israel's sin in chapter 312a. Now I want to see Israel's servitude because sin is always enslaving. And so our outline is going to follow. Remember these, the four cycles or the, the sin cycle. We're going to see sin, servitude. We're going to see supplication and we're going to see salvation. And we see it very clearly here. So as a result of Israel's sin, they immediately found themselves in servitude. But the tragedy here is this. It tells us, again in verse 12, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And then it says this, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. And uh, what a, a sobering and sad statement that God actually is the one who strengthens Israel's enemies against them. And of course, he's going to use Eglon as the means of his discipline. So we're going to think about Eglon the oppressor and the bondage that they came into. And of course, uh, his name is kind of an interesting, if you look at the grammatical meaning of his name, uh, it simply means a little calf. But as we later on will learn that he might have started out as a little calf, but he became a fatted calf that was ready for the slaughter. And so this little calf didn't stay so little for very long. And so uh, this is their oppressor, Eglon. Now, in the previous incident, uh, uh, the previous judge, uh, there were deliverance was from Mesopotamia. And so we remember that was a, a picture of the world where they'd come out of. And the Mesopotamians had actually had to come a long way to come into the land of Canaan to oppress them. But in this instance, uh, Moab didn't have to come very far. The armies of Mesopotamia came a long distance to invade Israel. The Moabites, the Ammonites, the Amalekites were not only neighbors, close neighbors, but they were even relatives of the Jews. If you remember, Lot was the nephew of Abraham, and (laughs) he was uh, the father of the Moabites through an incestual relationship with his daughters and the Ammonites. And of course, Amalek was a descendant of Esau, just to to show that, uh, again, this descent of Amalek from Esau. Let's just go to Genesis 36, where we'll see the genealogy of the line of Esau. And we'll notice in verse 12, it says, And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. And then again, verse 19, it says, These are the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these are their dukes. And so clearly, Amalek, a direct descendant of Esau. So Esau... Uh, all close related to Israel. And of course, we recognize that they're a picture in this instance of the flesh. Um, Eglon is and Amalek always is a picture of the flesh. And we need to realize, of course, the flesh is very close to every one of us. (laughs) It's something that is very near at hand. Uh, In fact, it's very much part of who we are. We'll think more about that in a moment. So the, the, the Lord used those that were related to the Israelites, and they had established themselves in the territory southwest or southeast, should I say, of Canaan. And so they were really close neighbors. Uh, even before the time of the Exodus, they had established uh, their dwelling in that area. 
And of course, God had said that an, an Ammonite and a Moabite could not enter into the congregation of the Lord to the 10th generation, uh, because uh, when Israel were in the wilderness, they, they met not the children of Israel with bread and water. In fact, uh, there were no help whatsoever to the children of, of Israel. Uh, they, they had no interest in their welfare. In fact, they would have been happy to see Israel die in the wilderness. But as we've said, the flesh is very closely related to every one of us of which they typify or which they picture. Now, usually, as we've said, the Lord strengthens Israel. And so we'll see, for instance, in chapter 16, the Lord will strengthen Samson one more time. He usually uh, strengthens his people. But in this case, the Lord was on the side of Israel's foe. He strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, and he used Israel's enemies as his instruments to discipline his people. And again, what a tragedy it is when rebellion and disobedience to the Lord's commandments reaches such a level that he has to take the enemies of his people and strengthen them against his own people. Notice verse 13, though, it says, And he, speaking of Eglon, gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So obviously, he, he was strengthened by the Lord, but he was oblivious to that. And so he felt that he needed additional help. And so he went for, to get people who were like-minded to him. And, of course, he got uh, the help that he needed. Uh, from Ammon, again, who would be his brother or half-brother, so to speak, and then from Amalek, who, as we've seen, was related to, to Esau. And they attacked uh, the city of palm trees. Now, we know the city of palm trees. We know that to be Jericho, uh, that city that had been the first place where Israel's faith in God had seen them gain the victory. And of course, remember, it had been destroyed and there was a curse pronounced on anybody that would rebuild it. And so it would seem that maybe the children of Israel uh, had uh, dwelt in the city, but had not rebuilt the walls. And now uh, this attack coming across Jordan, the same route that Israel had come. And in order to do that to cross Jordan, they obviously had already uh, defeated uh, the two and a half tribes that were on the other side, they're always the first, it seems, to go into difficulty or to be defeated by the enemy. And so they would have had to defeat them before they came in to uh, Jericho and the city of palm trees. And so they came in and they smote the children of Israel. They smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. As we've said, the type here is as, as Mesopotamia represented the world in which the children of God have come out of and left behind. But if we're not careful, it can creep back in and bring us into bondage once again. Well, this is a type of the power of the flesh to overcome the saints. This is the picture that is given to us in uh, the uh, tyranny uh, of uh, Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, what we see, uh, and we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but we'll, we'll, we'll consider the other verses too, but just to get a big picture of why this is a, a, a clear picture of the flesh. We see in verse 17, it says, he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And so again, it, it shows that the flesh is generally self indulgent and it expresses itself in desires and practices and of course it's never it's never satisfied There's, it never says enough and so what a picture of the flesh this insatiable appetite to be to be fed and yet never ever satisfied and just keeps bloating and getting bigger and bigger and so here's this very worthy picture and then as we said it's it's got great desires, great appetites, great practices that are indulgent. And we see in verse 20, uh, it says that an Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. 
And so another aspect of the flesh, not only does the flesh have a voracious appetite, the flesh is self-indulgent. It wants things just for itself. And in particular, comfort and ease. This summer house would be on the roof and it would be a place where people would go in the hot summer and he had this summer house all to himself. And again, it's a picture of a fleshly life that is just loves to be pampered, loves to pamper self. And so this is a, a very graphic picture of the flesh. And again, joined with Amalek, which is also a consistent picture of the flesh. And so what is this flesh we're talking about? Well, it's our fallen and sinful nature that is inherited from Adam and incapable of change or improvement. Okay. We need to recognize that the flesh can never be improved at all. The fact that we struggle with the flesh when an individual wrestles with that, actually is sometimes we might be so troubled by the flesh that we even wonder, am I really a Christian? But actually, the, the very fact that we're troubled by the flesh is evidence that we are a Christian. That battle between flesh and spirit within us is actually proof positive that we're really saved. Because Prior to salvation, we sinned with impunity and it didn't bother us. We indulged the flesh with impunity and it didn't bother us. We consider it to be perfectly normal and natural. But once a child of God is truly born again, he actually becomes very conscious of this battle within. And so if we can use the New Testament language, I'm just going to go to Romans chapter 8 for a moment. And just uh, a very key verse, Romans 8 and verse 9, that tells us a very significant truth about the flesh and our relationship to it. And so he says in Romans 8 verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So he says, we're not in the flesh. It was, we're not, we're not dominated like we used to be, where we couldn't do anything else. We're not in the flesh, but, but the scripture does teach that the flesh is still in us. We're not in the flesh. We're not, it doesn't dominate our lives, but it is still in us. And there's this conflict, this resultant conflict that goes on. And one of the things the scripture tells us is to make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And of course, that's where in the, the struggle comes because we, we, the flesh loves to be pampered and we seem to enjoy it too. And if we're not careful, we can make provision for the flesh. And he tells us we're not to do that. We're not to go easy on ourselves. We're not to make provision for the flesh. So the tendency of the flesh as we've said, is to indulge itself and to grow out of proportion as a result of things that are easily nourished. It has this voracious appetite and is never, ever satisfied. And we need to learn that. So verse 14, it says, the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. 18 years of slavery to the flesh. And again, the previous uh, enemy, it was eight years before they cried to the Lord. Now it's 18 years. And it seems like they, it takes longer each time before they cry out to the Lord. Uh, what a tragedy. Uh, they, they, they live in bondage longer. The Apostle Paul, who, like Ehud, was from the tribe of Benjamin, reminds his readers Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. In other words, we don't owe the flesh anything. Uh, we've paid our dues. We, we lived in the flesh for long enough. Now we're born again. We're not, we're not obligated anymore. Uh, we're not debtors. We don't owe it anything. And yet, uh, if we do serve the flesh... He tells us, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's, it certainly doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation. We know that. But we do know that it will definitely damage 
the testimony of a child of God and their usefulness will be lost the more that they succumb to the dictates of the flesh, the less useful they will be in the service of the Lord. So Eglon possesses the city of palm trees, Jericho, the city that had first been defeated by faith, and now they're in subjection. But it tells us after 18 years, 18 long years, they, they cry out to the Lord. It says in verse 15, this is Israel's supplication, 15a, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera. And so they were finally got to the end of it. They got sick of it. They got sick of the flesh. They got sick of defeat. They got sick of bondage. And they, in the words again of another Benjamite, they came to this point, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? from the body of this death. And of course, the minute they cry to the Lord, the, the Lord raises up a deliverer. Each time they sinned, the discipline became more protracted, more painful. But the moment they turned to the Lord, he had answered their need and raised up a deliverer. And we need to recognize that the only way back to God in days of declension and departure is for us to cry out to God. It's not clever committees. It's not worldly planning that's going to put things to right in the church. It's, it's when a fleshly church gets to the end of it and tired of it, and we cry out to the Lord that the Lord will bring that revival, that change that we're crying out for. And so in days of declension, to cry out to the Lord, this is the great need of the hour. And so Israel's supplication as we've seen, is followed by Israel's salvation. Now, he's a Benjamite. And of course, we know what the word Benjamin means, right? It means son of my right hand. And ironically, he is, here is Ehud, who is a Benjamite, a son of my right hand. And it tells us he's a left-handed man. <laughs> How ironic that uh, a Benjamite would be a left-handed man. And of course, in this culture, uh, the left hand spoke of shortcoming. It was considered actually a, to be a curse. So as, as Ehud grew up, he probably wondered, Lord, why am I a Benjamite, a left-handed man? Now, it could be that he was born left-handed. Or as the text seems to indicate, there's a possibility that his right hand may have been handicapped in some way. And so he's a left-handed man. Now, by the way, he wasn't alone in Benjamin. There were others who were also left-handed men in the tribe of Benjamin. In fact, there seem to be quite a lot of them. Because if you look at chapter 20 of Judges and verse 16, it says, among all this people were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at an haired breadth and not miss. <laughs> and so uh, there was at least 701 uh, left-handed men in the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, but anyway, he, here's this left-handed man who, again, generally would be considered uh, to be uh, a sign uh, of not of strength, the right hand is usually the symbol of strength. And, and of course, uh, this left hand would be considered weakness, a curse, all the rest of it. And again, it's just proof positive as we look at judges, how God delights always to use the weak and foolish things, the things that are considered nothing to bring to naught things that are. This is how God works. And so what a great encouragement that is to us. But remember, too, that believers in this present day owe our spiritual life to a son who is at God's right hand. <laughs> how thankful we are. And just like Benjamin, we received our life out of the death of another. Do you remember that when Benjamin was born, his mother died? And again, we der derive our life out of the death of another. And as a result of that, as a result of the debt we owe to the son at God's right hand and to the one that gave his life that we might have life, well, we're, we're under obligation. 
we owe it to the Lord to walk in the spirit so we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. How we need to be those that are known for walking in the spirit and not succumbing, fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Verse 16, it says, but he had made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. So as we learn about the deliverer, we notice that he spent time alone in secret. And he knew the need to fight the enemy is never ending, never ceases. And so he got alone and he prepared him a sword for combat. And this is the way of usefulness, isn't it? This is how God could take us up and use us despite our weakness. If we spend time in secret alone with God, in anticipation of the opportunity to be used. This is essential. And it was a personal sword. You notice it says uh, he made him a sword. He made him, it was personal to him. And and so this two-edged sword, and of course a two-edged sword, as we know, of course it's a beautiful symbol of the word of God, which is that two-edged sword sharper than any double-edged sword, actually, the sword of the spirit. Uh, but it's a beautiful symbol. But, but this man, he, he made this sword. He crafted for himself a sword. And, uh, of course, he would need to use it on himself first, spiritually speaking, before he could be truly effective in using it on his enemies because a two-edged sword cuts both ways. And of course, if we want to be used of God, we have to let the word of God go through us first before it ever could do any damage to somebody else. We have to apply the scriptures uh, to our own hearts. And so it says, only as believers read and meditate upon and apply the word of God directly to their lives, that it will have the desired effect. And what it will do is, as we spend time in the word of God, it will constantly judge the flesh and do a work in us that nothing else could accomplish. And so how we need to be those that know the sword, know how to use the sword, are, are handy with the sword. And notice he put his sword under his clothes. It was not only a personal sword, it was one he crafted himself, but it was a hidden sword. And again, we're reminded of the words of Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. A hidden sword, a personal sword, but a sword that he would use in combat. Just as the Lord Jesus, as we think of Luke chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, when the Lord Jesus met the enemy, he had spent a lot of time on the sword. And he knew how to use it when, when the attack from the enemy came. And again and again, we see the Lord Jesus say, it is written, it is written. And he had the very right word for each particular temptation because he had spent a lot of time getting to know that sword. So here's this sword. It's a personal sword. It's a hidden sword. But notice um, it, it tells us that this hidden sword was not discovered. And uh, we would find that, um, like our modern-day monarchs and presidents, Eglon no doubt would have been surrounded by his own secret service agents. And these bodyguards, I suspect, had become careless because they would only frisk a man on their left side, the side where weapons were normally carried by right-handed men. And so when he went to see the king, he managed to get right through because his sword was on his right side, on his right thigh. And again, we say this, God never makes mistakes. I'm sure perhaps there were times when Ehud wondered, why God did you make me a left-handed man? But Psalm 139 tells us that God made no mistakes when he made any of us. <laughs> we were perfectly crafted and formed in our mother's womb. And God made us the way we are because he wants to use us with our uniqueness for his glory. 
And so God was fitting us together in our mother's womb for some service for him in a day that would come when the opportunity would present it. It was all by divine design. And so when Ehud drew his sword, I'm sure he was thinking, thank you, Lord, for making me a left-handed man. It's not a curse after all. It's a blessing. It enabled me to, to actually defeat the enemy on behalf of my people. And so verse 17, it says, he brought the present to Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. Now, there's lots of suggestions on what the present was that the uh, children of Israel were bringing to this man. Some think it was maybe tribute money. Others suggest, and I, I think this seems to be perhaps more of a legitimate option, that it was a gift of food, that he brought a gift of food uh, in hopes that it would appease Eglon. But you know, it's an amazing thing. It never, ever works when, when because again, this man who pictures the flesh, well, let's give him food and hopefully it'll get it out of the system. You know how it is with the flesh, the enemy tempts us. Go ahead, give in, you, you, you know, get it out of your system and you'll be fine. But you know, when you give into the flesh, you don't get it out of your system. You actually get it into your system <laughs> and it becomes more and more enslaving. And so it never works. Temptation is just like a fire. The more you feed it, the more it demands. And the flesh is the same. The more you feed it, the more it demands. It's always a bad idea to try and appease that which is oppressing you. It'll only make the enemy bigger, fatter, and heavier. And so, and again, we, we need to ask, this is an interesting question. These resources that have been brought to Eglon, the enemy, were meant for the people of God. They were God's inheritance, right? This land flowing with milk and honey was for them. It was God's, in a sense, gifts for them that they were supposed to enjoy. And now they were using it to feed the enemy. And one person has wondered how much of the resources, gifts, etc., that have been given to the children of God are being used to feed the Eglons of this world. Think about that. How much resources that have been given to God's people that were for their enjoyment and for their usefulness, their strengthening, their, their uh, empowerment, if you like, are actually being given to the, to the flesh. And our culture would encourage us with words like this, you owe it to yourself to squander our precious God-given resources on a self-indulgent and fleshly life. And nobody would blame us for it because the culture says you owe it to yourself. But folks, we don't owe it to ourselves. We owe everything to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And so the word of God tells us, and I'm going to just read Galatians chapter 6 just for a moment and verse 8. Galatians 6 in verse 8, it says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life or life everlasting. And so <laughs> we need to make sure that we're not pampering ourselves. We're not giving in to the dictates of our flesh, but we're using our God-given resources and energy to serve the best of masters, the Lord Jesus, because the flesh is never satisfied. It never, ever says it's enough. It always demands more. And so verse 18, it says, and when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. Now, part of the reason he did this was he had a plan that he had crafted alone 
and he didn't want them implicated. What if the plan went wrong? He didn't want anybody else implicated. He would take full responsibility. He would himself go in faith in God, and he would put an end to this oppressor, this tyrant that was over the people of Israel. And once he had done that, he would know when the right time was to blow the trumpet and call them to join him in the battle. But he felt he had to conquer the flesh himself first before he could get others to join him in the battle. And so in verse 19, he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. Now, here's a very interesting scripture. Of course, Gilgal, again, we've talked about Gilgal. Remember, it was the place of the cutting away of the flesh, the place where the children of Israel were circumcised once they'd crossed the Jordan. It was a picture of cutting off of the flesh and of resurrection life. Remember, the, the stones in the bottom of the water were covered over, and the stones on the bank showing our old life died, is left at the bottom of the water, our new life, resurrection life, on the other side, promised land. And so it's a picture of resurrection life, a picture of cutting away of the flesh, this circumcision. And so he goes to Gilgal. Now, this word quarries that is mentioned here, it says he himself turned again from the quarries. The word literally is is uh, graven images. And some think that it's referring to the 12 stones that were set up by Joshua when Israel crossed over Jordan. And others suggest that actually in this very sacred place of memorial stones, it had been desecrated by the putting up of graven images on that very precious site of historical significance. If that's the case, and again, we can't be definitive, but if it is the case, you can see how that would have really kind of stirred the heart of Ehud when he had seen the results of the departure amongst the children of God, a precious memorial area, remembering their crossing Jordan, turned into a place of graven images that it caused him to turn back uh, with, with kind of a, a holy zeal to right the wrongs and to, to vindicate the name of the Lord. And so the man of God who has been to Gilgal, he could not tolerate the presence and domination of Eglon, nor should we tolerate the flesh and its workings. If we truly have learned a lesson from Gilgal, we should be unsparing in judgment on ourself and the slightest movements of the flesh. We should have no truck with it and deal with it very ruthlessly. So he goes back to the king, and again, we, he gets through all the security checks and everything like that uh, because his knife is hidden in a place unexpected. And he goes to the king and he tells him that he's got a special message from God for him. And so it says <clears throat> in verse 19, he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. So he, want, he was curious. He wanted to hear this secret message from God. And you get the impression uh, that the king, uh, he, he wants to hear the secret message. He requests for silence. The request for silence was a signal for officials to leave. Uh, he's sitting in the cool upper room of his palace as Ehud presents the message from God. He stands up reverently to hear the divine oracle and Ehud draws to his sword and delivered its fatal message. Perhaps the huge size of the king obscured even his view of what Ehud was doing with his arm as he walked towards him. And the unexpected use of the left hand prevented him from seeing Ehud's move. Because it's obvious there was no cry of alarm that was heard outside. 
And so it, it took him completely by surprise. So in verse 20, it says, Ehud came unto him. He was sitting in his summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. So Ehud, we would say, had a very pointed message from God for Eglon. <laughs> it was a very pointed message. And how we need men who can wield the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, in such a way that it pointedly is directed to the flesh in man, to its destruction and dethronement. As Warren Wearsby said, we don't need messages uh, that make us feel good. We need messages that comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And this was a very pointed message. F.B. Mayer uh, said some interesting thoughts on this verse. He says, I have a message from God for you. These just interesting points. God's messages are often secret. We get them in the private place when God speaks to us from his word. God's messages must be received with reverence. He stands up reverently to hear this message from God. God's message leaps out from unexpected quarters. Have you ever read an obscure passage and the Lord's used a verse in your life in a profound way? And you think, wow, that's a, I wasn't expecting it in that portion of scripture. And so God's messages leap out from unexpected quarters. God's messages are sharp as a two-edged sword and cause death. And all was death to self and the life of the flesh. And so verse 21, it says, Ehud put forth his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Spiritual victories are only won by the sword of the spirit, wielded directly uh, or correctly and directed specifically at the flesh in man. Verse 22, it says, and the haft also went in after the blade. The fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and the dirt came out. And what a, and a very appropriate illustration. When the sword of the spirit goes in, the dirt comes out. How shall a young man cleanse his way? The psalmist says, by taking heed there to according to thy word. That's how it's done, right? That's how a young man cleanses his way. When the word goes in, the dirt comes out. That's why it's so important what we're doing right now. We're not, it's not going through the Bible that makes a difference. It's the Bible going through us that makes a difference. When the word of God is meditated upon, is read reverently, it has a cleansing effect on our lives as we apply the truth of it. And so the dagger did a work that reached to the deepest parts of Eglon's flesh and could not be undone. Such would be the impact of the word of God on believers' lives once they have applied it to their hearts and consciences. It should have that transforming work. C.A. Coates says this, we have to kill the Moabite in ourselves. We need to use the sword so as to not allow ourselves to be robbed of the enjoyment of our inheritance. Because we have a wonderful inheritance. The children of Israel had a wonderful inheritance, but Eglon, the flesh, was robbing them of the richness of their inheritance. And the flesh is a terrible thief of our enjoyment of the riches of our inheritance. And so we need to recognize the need to apply the sword. And so it says, then Ehud, verse 23, went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. I like that. He shut the doors because he's not going back. He's done with Eglon. Oh, how wonderful it would be if we could get so great a victory over some aspect of the flesh in our lives that we determine by the grace of God we're not going back. 
we're done. We're, we're, we're finished with it. We've had enough. It, we're sick of serving it. We're done with it. We've rammed the sword through. We're closing the door behind that chapter. And certainly his victory was complete. And he had no desire to return to Eglon and the flesh. Now, verse um, 23 it tells us that uh, he locked. He, he had went forth through the porch, shut the doors, the parlor upon him, and locked them. And then, verse twenty-four and twenty-five, we have three little behold statements, which kind of highlight the utter surprise of uh, the servants of uh, Eglon. And so, notice it says, "And when he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, that behold, the doors of the parlor were locked." They said, surely he covered his feet in his summer chamber. So they're surprised that the doors are locked. Secondly, they tarried till they were ashamed. And behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore, he took a key and opened them. And so the second surprise is that they didn't, he didn't respond to their knocking and their calling. There's just no response. He, they're, they're surprised by that. And then the final surprise is, behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. So three surprises of the attendance of Ehud. Oh, sorry, of Eglon. Notice verse 26, and Ehud escaped while they tarried. While all this is going on, this long delay of not hearing a response, the doors locked, that he's not responding. It gave Ehud time to escape while they tarried. And he passed beyond the quarries and escaped unto Seraph. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before them. And so follow me, said the man who wielded his sword so effectively. And again, if we want to be a leader of the people of God, we need to be somebody who knows who, how to handle the sword of the word of God and use it effectively. And if, use it first on the flesh in our own lives. And once we do that, then we can legitimately call the people of God to battle. We, we can, as it were, blow the trumpet on the mountain and say, follow me, because we're enjoying that personal victory. His personal victory now gave him the moral right to invite others to follow him and allowed him to unite a people that had been in total disarray. And by the way, Ehud's name, we haven't mentioned it up until now, but it literally means united. And so this man who knew how to use the sword, who had power over the flesh, by the effective working of the sword, was able to unite the people of God to defeat the enemy. And oh, there's such a need today, isn't there? For, for, for men and women who, who are not fleshly, uh, who, who have got victory over the flesh, who know the word of God, know how to use the word of God, and who can call the people of God to the battle of the ages, summon them to come and join the fight. And people are desperate for godly leadership who would say, follow me, who can lead the people of God, like Paul, who can say, follow me, even as I follow Christ, and can lead the people of God uh, in victory. And so the book of Judges will reveal that as time progresses, the numbers that respond to the, the judge's call will get less and less and less until we get to Samson. And it's almost like Samson is a solo agent. Nobody will come to his aid. In fact, even the men of Judah will chastise him and say, don't you realize that we, we serve the Philistines? And the tragedy is that it seems that the darker it gets, uh, the less people who are willing to follow a man with a sword 
who has got victory over the flesh. <clears throat> when the Eglon of self has received its death wound, the glad trumpet of freedom can be blown on the hills. And notice verse 29. It says, they slew of Moab, Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and they escaped not a man. That word lusty literally means fat men. <laughs> there were fat men following the fat man. And what it tells us that the Moabites were totally dominated by the flesh. And the people of God were able to defeat them. And they did it at the fords of Jordan. As they were, uh, their leader had been killed, perhaps they were fleeing back uh, across Jordan and the children of Israel rallying to Ehud's cry met them there. And they, at that time, killed 10,000 men, all lusty men of valor. They, they were fat men, but they were, they were also uh, men of valor. They were brave men. They were, they were strong men. And so they escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. Now notice that it's now 80 years. The last rest was 40 years. Now it's 80 years, so a much longer period of rest this time. Through Ehud's effective use of the sword, the oppressor was destroyed and the land had rest. I want to remind us of the words of the Lord Jesus in his high priestly prayer. He says this, sanctify them through thy truth. Make them holy. Set them apart through your truth. Thy word is truth. He also said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How do we get freedom from the tyranny of the flesh? Well, it's that double-edged sword. It's the application of that double-edged sword that gives victory, no matter how heavy, how e Eglon-like the problem, if we can apply the word of God effectively in our lives, we'll be set free. The Lord Jesus promised it. Now, ironically, prior to all this, if the Jews had had a ballot as to who would be their leader to overthrow Eglon, Probably Ehud wouldn't even make it on the ballot, <laughs> this left-handed man, but he was God's man. He turned his disability into a possibility because he depended on the Lord and he depended on the sword and victory came over the enemy, Eglon, a very graphic picture of the flesh. May God give us a similar victory over the flesh in our lives and its tyranny. Amen.